Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. So guys, welcome back to another show. Uh, this week, another coaching family special. Well, um, joined by my my good friend and colleague Glenn Hicks. Welcome back to the show, mate. Thanks for having me, as always, mate. Looking forward to this one again. Looking forward. So, like uh, like I said, uh, the topic of this week is possession. Does it really matter? And obviously, watching the games on the weekend, and particularly the West Ham Brighton game, very interesting game. Um, and just obviously, look, there's many different ways we can talk about it. It's kind of sure it's going to go on many different tangents, but the basic premise there, thinking about West Ham there, like the possession stats were ridiculously low, but you know, but won that game, won, won it convincingly. And then obviously, so then you know, then that begs the question does possession matter? So, what's, uh, what's your thoughts on that? I think it's really important just to, to start with, so about if I had my youth development hat on and like a senior football first team, like the West Ham's of the Premier League, I think. My answer would be slightly different, so I'll try and give you the quick answer. I think in, in youth development, yes, absolutely, I think it should be an obsession with the ball, regardless to your style, you know, whether you want more dribblers or passers. At the top level, though, let's be honest, it's all about efficiency, isn't it? So I think there's some incredible stats out there. I remember the Barcelona versus Celtic game, when I think it's still a record now, where Barca had something like 89% or 81% possession, um, but... Fraser Forster was immense and Celtic nicked it 2-1. You've got Leicester City that won the Premier League with the lowest stats ever, one of the only teams under 50% possession to win the league. So I'd say it matters with both, but I think with youth development, it's absolutely essential if you're trying to develop footballers. There should be an obsession with it. And at the top level, I thought West Ham were outstanding the other day, by the way. So I thought they was their defending was immense and their efficiency. When you talk about technical quality, you look at the goals of Mikel Antonio, and uh, Jared Bowen. So really, it's about the efficiency and the quality of your possession, isn't it? In terms of defining the game, winning and losing a game of football. So that's where I would start, mate. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose that this is a youth development podcast. I mean, that's you know, that's our we're having you know our youth development hats on. <clears throat> so I mean, does it matter? I mean, yeah, I'm the same. Like in youth development, I think you know you should always be aspiring to to dominate the ball, dominate possession. Um, and we had this chat before, didn't we? I mean, I remember putting on something on on socials last year or whenever it was, and I said, you know, I, I, you know, I put this question out: if you're a youth development, because I watched a game, watched an, an under twelves game, one someone gave me, and it was two big category one teams. One team was trying to play out, and the other team was just shelling it, basically M- massive club. You know, was basically just sticking in the mixer every time. And the question was, you know, is there a place for that in youth development? And obviously, my I mean, whether I'm, you know, just a purist or an extremist, I thought, you know, I, I was quite surprised, actually. A lot of people said, no, yeah, there is a place for it, you know, maybe 50-50. And I was thinking, what are you sure? Like, you know, really, like, what is, you know, the what are the benefits, really, of, you know, getting it and just sticking it in the mixer for an under-12s team? Do you know what I mean? Particularly, you know, particularly as you're looking at two clubs that are quite well-balanced here, you know, two massive cat ones all right it's different like you know maybe for example if you're you're a smaller club you're planning against a big team okay we'll set up maybe we don't want to get turned over you help your teammates a little bit you help your boys a little bit or your girls think okay maybe we will play a little bit on the counter to try and support them rather than you know just getting steamrolled over 10 nil but for me if you're a big t- big club and you're you know and you're you know you're a big category one surely you should be trying to play football surely you should be trying to play out from the back and keep possession i mean that's that's you know you're trying to develop Champions League players you know and that's for me I can't couldn't get never get my head around you know does possession matter of course it does Do you know I mean what sort of academy are you cat one academy are you if you're sticking it in the mixer at under twelves do you know, do you know, do you know, does that mean that or am I just being too much of an extremist purist there no no I, I do totally agree with you but someone said something to me once when I kind of responded to something you know he's he's a, he's a bit of a sage and a magpie in football but um. A sage driver, it makes us look like magpies. But he he basically said, Glenn, give me a penalty box specialist over 10 halfway line players. And I get what he meant. So the whole point, putting it in the mix up, there is value to it. But again, I think whether you're just lumping balls up to the striker or just lumping it in the box, like we know what that looks like, proper agricultural. But if you're actually working on long range passes, you know, you might have a part of your plan, or your individual plan where your centre halves have really got to develop their range because they might be under 12, is about to go in 13s, 14s, the pitch is going to get bigger. So again, depending on what your objectives are, 
Um, I think there's nothing wrong with long passes and I don't think we should frown upon long passes. But again, there's a difference. When there's, I call it pick, like pick your play. When there's purpose, intent and control behind the long pass, you know, if otherwise we're never going to get Toby Alderweire that can play that 50 yard pass. Do you know what I mean? Or you look at Trent Alexander Arnold's crosses from like 30 to 40 yards out, like the proper in swing in Beckham style crosses. So I think there's a time and a place for it. But but I'm with you. It's like how many times do you do it, and where's the trade-off? So if the ball's going over the three midfielders, and you're playing four three three. Well, I would say, or you're playing three in there in a step nine side. Why are you playing three in there anyway? Because if you're going to keep going over their heads, so. I think there's always a trade-off, so, but I'm not against the long pass, especially, you know, even with the goalkeepers, it's such an essential tool. You don't want a goalkeeper to get to under 13s and not be able to kick a ball properly. And I mean that all ranges, to be able to wrap it into his centre half, side to side, clip it, pitch them lovely ones into the next line. And actually, he's got to be able to kick the ball properly, you know, over a long distance. So I'm not, I'm not absolute in my way of thinking, but we've got to play football and play through the team as much as possible and get as many of the yeah. kids on Possible. But I mean, it, there's a difference between playing over and then just, you know, sticking in the channels for your four to run. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, mm -hmm. so for example, what I'm saying is that, you know, if, if a, a team is encouraging you to play out and you're not taking that challenge on, you're just saying, no, I'm just going to stick it, stick it over as well. And it's not like a 1v1 there, maybe your four is outnumbered. You're saying, well, rather than risk it, I'm just going to go over all the time. I think that's the problem. Do you know what I mean? Because then you're saying, what sort of players you're creating? And look, we all want those penalty box players. But the problem is that, you know, if you're bypassing half your team every single time your goalie's got the ball, who's improving? Do, 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 do yeah. that make sense? So I just think, you know, and, and, and I had this conversation the other day, people saying, you know, talking about possession, you know, going on to individual possession. People saying, oh, maybe now there's too much dribbling in academy football and stuff like this. And I'm thinking like, goodness me, like, don't you remember where we were about 15, 20 years ago when we couldn't produce a player save our lives because we just used to shell it all the time. No one produced a player out from the back. You know what I mean? I think there's a really big, so people forget how, you know, far we've come as a football culture in the last 10, 20 years, you know, in terms of where we've, we've like dragged ourselves from like, you know, being Neanderthals of European football, do you know what I mean? To be finally being like, you know, into modernity where we're playing modern football, we're playing through the first, playing out for the back, thanks to like people like Pep and stuff who brought that, you know, the modern game to this country. And it's taken so long to finally, you know, we've got cultured defenders we've got culture midfielders who can get on the ball you know with such much more sort of an intellectually football you know culture if you like you know and also maybe there is some trade-offs or maybe we don't have those old school sort of big center backs those sort of things you know what i mean but i think we've come such a long way but people you know this people say oh you know people spend too much time on the ball and you know we're talking about possession you know but i'm at the thing with them i think you know move on to individual possession don't we that's the key is like you know how important is individual possession how important is it important that we get our <clears throat> excuse me our nines tens elevens twelves to get on the ball and stay on the ball under pressure and when you're doing that you know when you're bypassing you're mm. you're 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 bypassing that risk because of why? Because obviously it's the ego of the coach or the whoever's the management. No, I want to win that game. You know, you're bottling it basically, and you're doing a disservice to the players because you're not allowing them to take on that risk and develop that under pressure. And that's what the individual possession is about. You know, understanding right? Yeah, I'm going to get you know, my players do that. I'm going to play out. I'm going to play a bit of pressure. Okay, we might not win. You know, I might not beat this other big cat one, but I'm going to be brave and do that because that's what the players need. The centre backs need that. The full backs, the midfielders need to receive it. Otherwise, they're just watching it go over the head all the time. We need to try and play through so we can create those goal scoring opportunities. So I think that's the problem. I think with this whole argument, so, you know, we're talking about group sets, we're really talking about individual possession, aren't we? So we can mm. develop these players who are good on the ball, and maybe we encourage them to spend a bit more time on the ball. So when they get to the end game, when they say, so you know, if you look at Man City. You know, every player who plays now in Man City is that they are really good on the ball individually. Their individual possession skills are excellent, whether they're a centre-back like your John Stones or your full-backs. Carl Walker can break lines. Every single midfielder or no front player can you know, stay on the ball under pressure and basically break lines with the ball. No, definitely, mate. And I think... I think, you know, going back to, if we just touch on like the 80s and 90s, for example, when we look at both ends of the pitch, I think we was blessed. If you look at the 90s for strikers and centre-halves, I think 90s and going into the noughties, I think we had some of the best centre-halves ever in the history of English football. When you think about, you know, Sol Campbell, to Tony Adams, Rio Ferdinand, uh, even the likes of Jonathan Woodgate, Ledley King that had injury and stuff. I could keep going, Jamie Cameron. There was loads of centre-halves. But there was, mm. in the 90s, for example, when we grew up, so you had a ton of number nines, didn't you? Whether it was 
Les Ferdinand, I think the top nine or ten English centre forwards, including when you put like attacking midfield like Matt Letizia in it, again, penalty box specialist. We had a lot of number nines. Robbie Fowler could couldn't even get a cap really, and he was one of the best young finishers around in Europe, if I'm honest off of both feet but I think it was a byproduct of the way that football was played and I think this whole myth about the winning formula like the whole Charles Hughes things put the ball in the box a certain amount of times well actually if 20 teams in the league at senior level are all playing the same way direct 4-4-2 football well guess what the champions are going to be a direct 4-4-2 but what's take like if you go to Spain now and you look at the possession stats, I think you flip it on its head the last 15 years. You know, they're higher possession teams and it's about pass, pass, pass and mm. dominate possession, high percentage. And it's like you said, it's slowly come over and changed the culture. And I think we always have to ask, well, what are we trying to achieve? Because I watched the game the other day from a lad in Australia that through the, my personal football coach that we're, we're, I mean, they're a really big team in Australia as well. And I looked at it so and it was quite heartbreaking to watch the game as well, because I can see there's some very good footballers on the pitch trying to do certain things but because of the approach from the coach and now put it forward all you can hear is like put it forward you know you know hit the wing hit the wide, and they're bypassing everything like you said they're hitting it wide and they're hitting it forward why well i looked at the pitch and i heard the wind it was a little bit windy it was a little bit bobbly on the pitch but i'm looking at thinking well how did stanley matthews and and pele and garinja how did, how did these artists play on these pitches there's there's a clip of r9 isn't there playing on that muddy pitch i don't know if you've seen it for inter milan have you seen it where he tore them apart? And I'm thinking yeah. it's all just excuses to give in to your fear, your fear of failing or your fear of not quite getting mm. it perfect. Who cares about perfect? I think you you get even more success out of try, at least trying to play football on a farm of a pitch or in windy and rain. Do it in all conditions because the very, very best players can do it in all conditions. And I think even if you can't succeed in all conditions, you can always try and I think that's the main thing. Keep trying. Stop finding excuses about the weather or they're bigger boys or they're smaller boys. And, you know, there's there's always an excuse to find to not play that way, to to play. And I don't think it is winning football. I really don't. I think I think the biggest risk you'll ever take is to kick it over a kid's head. That's the biggest risk because you're, it's the fastest route to not develop players, in my opinion. It's the quickest yeah. route to to leaving players underdeveloped. And also you made the great point there, what we're trying to achieve. And that's the point. We're trying to, you know, develop a team that's capable of winning the World Cup, a team that can challenge consistently from the top draft. And that's what we've done now. We've come to a position where, we, you know, like I said, we've been, you know, the dark ages of football and we haven't got anywhere near, you know, competing consistently compared to our, you know, particularly our continental neighbours, you know, around our doorstep, those teams that we should be and we are now, you know, there, you know, at the table, you know, challenging doing that. So that's what we're trying to do. And that's what, you know, think about these, you know, we we're so bad at that in the past. Now we're trying to do that. So that's that's why individual possession is so key. And also then you try and build up some of these misconceptions. It's not just about dribble, 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 you know, stand the ball, you know, do 20 step overs, that sort of thing. Those individual, that individual possession can look different. It looks like, you know, your, your practice where you're being like a bit more like Chavi, trying to pick it up and turn and then play forward, but turn on a little bit longer, you know, so I can receive it under pressure, break pressure and then play forward quickly. You know, not necessarily about breaking a line with the ball at my feet. It's about maybe breaking pressure to create a half a yard to then play forward you know still you know so still it looks different for different sorts of players it's not just about you know head down dribble 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 it's a bit more sophisticated than that but the key is at the highest level the individual possession needed to play at the highest level whether you're you know a goalie or a center back or a you know a striker you need to be able to get on the ball stay on the ball in the pressure and then play forward and then try and break lines that break lines might be you know dribbling with it or it might be passing it or might be breaking lines with a run do you know what I mean so it's understanding what that looks like and it's different but sure at the very youngest ages you give them a bit more time on the ball to express themselves you know be a bit more creative and spend the time on the ball because this is what that's what you know players need that time on the ball I, I'm so just like I was doing a session tonight it's under eight session I could see this kid you know, he's so uncomfortable with the ball at his feet, his movement, especially his left side is like, you know, he's looking like he's so stiff. And I thought, goodness me, it's like, that's what people don't understand as well. I go bang on about all the time. It's like, you know, you, you, you know, you do your ball mastery. I still go to academies. I still, they're not doing one ball each. I think what they're doing, I can't believe it. You know, you mm. know, you, you give, give players time on the ball to develop and build their agility and their balance on both sides. It makes them more explosive, more dynamic. It just helps them replay in the game. I can yeah. move both sides. I don't have to play the way I'm facing all the time. I can move. I can challenge. It opens up the games for a player. And, you know, whether it's beginners or, you know, elite, aspiring elite players, it's like they're so important, that individual time on the ball, because it develops that individual possession. And you've got the players who are better at individual possession, then, you know, that's when group possession becomes easier, right? 
Absolutely. And I think that whole movement thing is a big key thing as well. So especially we know, you know, we're obsessed with the whole dynamic ball mastery stuff. And we've come from a lot of that philosophy at Spurs with John McDonough, Chris Ramsey and stuff. And I'm like, really grateful for that. But I just think when you look at the best players in all positions, for, go through the generations as well. Look at Bobby Moore. What a wonderful mover. What an elegant mover. And again, forget the environment, forget the lack of technology or sports vests and forget the fact that I'm watching a non-league game yesterday. So, um, uh, Eastleigh versus Aldershot. I watched a bit of that and I thought, blimey, this pitch is probably better than most most top level World Cup final pitches and and, and pitches of 50s and 60s. Do you know what I mean? The level of pitches nowadays is amazing. But I look at I think, forget all that. Forget all the fluff around it. Look at Rio Ferdinand, what a wonderful mover he was. But, you know, he spent a lot of his childhood in midfield. You know, even John Terry didn't get enough credit for how well balanced he was on two feet. The fact that he could turn to his left and make a great block yeah. tackle, turn to his right equally, sprint left, sprint right. And then he could actually open up on his right foot and spray it 70 yards. I think Paolo Maldini is another one. What an incredible mover. When you talk about speed, agility, hip mobility, balance yeah. on two feet. I could go around the pitch and pick some of the best players. And again, they had these universal kind of talents or techniques and abilities and movement and mobility is one of them. And definitely technical ability, you know, with their receiving, retaining, I call it the uh, individual ball responsibilities, don't I? You know, receiving, retaining, releasing and retrieving the ball. You know, they're all good at getting the ball back in their own way. And, and again, getting the ball back comes from having good movement, doesn't it? Being good across the ground, being agile, low. And mm. yeah, so again, we can keep going into it, but there's just so many more benefits by forget the fact that they even lose the ball. Was they attempting to twist on their left because they're uncomfortable? Right, he's going to lose the ball because he's uncomfortable, ain't got the physical literacy yet or the competency. And again, it's about fear. So a lot of it's fear, isn't it? We've got to face that fear. We've got to break through them barriers and accept that there's going to be car crash moments and there's going to be a lot of stickiness and difficulty if if we're doing things right. Yeah, I mean, I think also it's understanding like the journey, isn't it? So like, I always talk about my experiences you know, working with the foundation phase and you know if, when you're hammering individual possession at under nine under nine under ten and, and you get to under 11 and it opens up a little bit the, the pitch is coming bigger and then you start doing more group possession stuff because you know you need to help the players goodness me it's so much more easier to do that when the players have the individual basics those brilliant basic the individual possession techniques when you then you start opening up doing more possession stuff and your run nodes and your positional practices it becomes so much easier because once you can stand the ball and you master the ball the one touch stuff comes easy do you know what i mean it's, and then i've seen that it's just so true and i think people get it the wrong way around sometimes that's why this obsession with rondos which listen i like think rondos is a great practice rondos and positional exercise if you watch one of my sessions it's going to have elements of that in it but at the very youngest ages to be too obsessed with it because what that just does is just means ev that you know, everything's one two touch bang 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 which is okay but then when do the players get the time to spend time on the ball you know they think oh yeah, everything in a rondo everything in a rondo under eights and the nines you know, players need some time to express themselves a bit more it needs to be a bit messy it needs to be a bit more you know a bit more stuff going on players making mistakes and dribbling trying things you know it doesn't it shouldn't be so pretty and organized you know what i mean when you get older and they get into 11 11 then you can spend more time doing that you can do your patterns and play and stuff like that i mean i see t's the other day like under eights on the nines doing patterns passing patterns i think crazy in my opinion that's what you know that's such a you know, a new, that's such a, you know, an unusual thing to do with the very youngest. Just let them play and dribble, yeah. play small sided things that express themselves and combination play and 2v2s, 3v3s, 4v4s, because those street like outcomes are going to be, that's the players. And you give me those players. And then when I get to 11s or 12s or 13s, then I'll, you know, start doing group possession because they miss a point. You know, there's no point in spending all time in group possession with all these young players because they get to a point where they individual possession is so poor. That's going to make the group possession struggle anyway they're going to not as going to be as good as it you know and they might be able to play square play forward and all that but you're not going to have an effective team because your individuals aren't as good enough on the ball absolutely and and all group possession is anyway it relies on the technical competency on the 11 or 7 or 9 aside players whatever players you've got on the pitch so if we want to play it from the back but the goalkeeper keeps lifting his foot up and the ball goes under his foot every time we're going to have a tough day so I think it always comes down to the technical competency as well. And even if you look at the top level, even if you're playing like a long ball game, I think people underestimate when, you know, let's say a, a, a Sean Dyche or Tony Pulis team, you, you've still got to have really good ball striking abilities from the back to play up to a Kenwin Jones or a Peter Crouch. And Peter Crouch has got to have outstanding receiving techniques. And yeah. But with that whole thing, playing it up to the striker as well. So, you know, what really used to frustrate me when I used to watch England teams is I used to watch it. I remember being a really young coach and I can't remember if it was around about 2000. I can't remember what it was, but I'm looking and play it up you know, and sometimes on your coaching course, you've got to talk as well, you know, the best pass is the first one, furthest one forward. Well, I'm like, exactly. well, hang on a minute. He's up there on his own. 
He's surrounded by three players. He's got to work like a cart horse to bring it down. He's going to exert all of his energy. Then when he loses it, the coach and everyone's going to moan it and go and hold it up. He's like, well, hang on, I'm doing my best here. When really, again, that whole thing about, I think skillfully from a young age, so we can teach, we can put little bits of intelligence on passes just by asking why. So, you know, that this is a really easy one for the listeners to say. The whole thing about never pass across your goal, that is like mm. in the top three, of grassroots football right across the country, from Hackney Marsh's men's teams right down. And I know it because I've lived in grassroots football for a long, long time. So why not? I would say, well, why? Ah, oh, because you might lose it and you might score. Well, I would say, okay. I'd tell the little kid, you know, little Sam or Susie, whoever, actually, you can play across your goal. But what I want you to see, if you can see your, your other player is available and you've got a path, play it. I said, but you see that centre forward? If you play it slowly or bobbly or near that player, what might happen? The kid might come up with the answer, go, oh, he might nick it and score. All right, so how do you think, if you're going to play across the pitch, across your own box to your mate over there 20 yards away, how might you do that? And then you start talking about the speed, like you've got to really wrap it across to him, because remember, the quicker the ball travels, the less time the defender has to nick it, then you're almost, it sounds like you're storytelling, but you're putting a bit of wire a bit of understanding on the pass. So it should be, you pass anywhere you like, just make it a good pass. And if the, even if the centre forward's there, you might, you might even think, I'm going to chip it over. Fine, chip it over, but don't do it so floaty that your mate's under pressure. Do it over here a little bit. Do you know what I mean? But my point is, are you putting into context there, a little bit of game context and a why? Not just, oh, it was a bad pass, don't ever do it again. And I think you can do that all over the pitch. So I've got one so I'm obsessed with, and everyone, anyone that comes and watches a passing drill of mine or, or anything to do with passing, I've got this little saying that I love to say. I say, stop just passing it to each other. And people go like, what do you mean? Sometimes the response is, what do you mean? We've got to pass the ball to each other. And I go, no, 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 no. Look at each other, work out what your mate wants and pass it for him. And they go, what do you mean? Or well, well, what is he doing? Is he showing you his right foot, his left foot? Is he running? Is he doing this to his chest? And then give him as near to the best pass that he wants. And then they start thinking, and, and honestly, so even if you just plant a little seed like that, they start thinking, oh, I actually, now I've got to look at what my mate wants before I give him the ball rather than just kicking it aimlessly. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I mean, that's what, the other thing I was going to say, you know, even when you're working, for example, doing stuff with the eights and nines, there's still elements of group possession in it because when I'm doing my 2v2s, my 3v3s, I'm talking about, you know, okay, balance, you know, I even said to I said to the, to the boys, hey, look, you think like you got scale between two v two game to like almost like with two keepers. You know, we play keeps playing out. Thinking like it's got balance. You need balance here. Think about scales. You know, one goes one side, then the other one goes the other side. Trying so when you're moving, I'm thinking about I'm moving just, not by myself. It's a different to one v one now. I'm just trying to dominate the player. Now when I'm moving, I'm moving in relation to my friend, my teammates. So I'm making a run. Maybe I'm going across. If because then he goes that way, maybe I go the opposite. Like, so you have that idea, you give them visual of the balance. So you still work on those group possession ideas, but you're breaking it right down more to call cool, like microcosmic examples of the game, but within a 2v2 or the 3 v threes, that's where the journey starts, isn't it? Rather than saying, right, okay, we go under nines, let's bang straight into a 7v7 or a 9v9. Because, you know, then we can really talk about group possession. Well, group possession actually is 2v2s and 3v3s as well. And that's where it starts, isn't it? You know, we all say, well, that's where balance starts. The defending starts. I'm playing in a two. He goes up, we lose the ball. Like I said tonight to the boys, you know, 2v2, right? You know, just goal side, big balance. You can't have someone running beyond you. You need balance. There's no balance there, is it? If he's gone that way and you're up top. So you still have those elements of group possession, but it's just age appropriate, isn't it? It's those building blocks. Thinking sure. like, where, how does that group possession look in a 2v2? What does it look like in a 3v3? What does it look like in a 4v4? And you hammer those. And why are you doing that? That group possession, you still got those real great creative street outcomes. You've got those little 1v1 jewels everywhere, you know, those 2v1s or those little overloads, however you want to do it. But that's the key, isn't it? Understanding, you know, what's age, what's the best way to give these players, especially the young players, those group possession sort of ideas but still getting lots of individual outcomes, lots of getting lots of the main things want to get contacts with the ball, didn't you? Well, many times with the boys and the girls getting on the ball as much of the time, little one v one duels can even set up more. So it is more, you know, more passing or, you know, passing, receiving centric, if you like, but still have it, you know, have to, you know, it's ball to player ratios, isn't it? That's the key, isn't it? You know, nines, tens, elevens, foundation phase, as many contacts with the ball as possible. And I think that's another way we've gone, we've lost touch of it a little bit. Everyone's so desperate to get them into the 77s or the 99s and look into a game here. It's like, well, how many, you know, quality contacts are your players having with the ball? I mean, it's funny, like a lot of the pros who come to me, the Premier League players saying, you know, I'm just not getting a lot of time to practice what I'm supposed to be good at. You know, I'm not getting a lot of time to practice. And, you know, we're doing everything in boxes, do lots of group possession, if you like, but I'm not getting 
getting time to do that. And that's different about those young guys. I mean, those guys are the the end of you know the different scale, aren't they? They're on a different part of their journey. But with the young players, think about that. You know, how many times you've given these players opportunities to do their duels, contact to the ball, forward passes, shots on target, shooting, that sort of thing. You know, how many times you actually getting these players getting time to practice it, or are you trying to how much time you're spending to try and get you know your, your team looking good for the weekend? Yeah, that's the main thing, isn't it? Like people are more obsessed about the team looking good or the sessions looking good and stuff. And like we know. Development in general, when you're trying to develop anything, it's chaos, isn't it? There's a lot of failure, and failure is not opposite to success. It's a huge part of it. And again, all these things sound really cliche, but it really is. And there's going to be stumbling blocks at times, though. So we've almost got to create, we've almost got to put landmines in the session and create what I call controlled failure or controlled adversity. We've got to, we should be intentionally and skillfully putting difficulty in there. So if a kid's just taking five shots and it five out of five, well, you better not let him get six out of six. You've, you've got to stress him in some way, whether it's give him a different type of ball to deal with or speed it up, slow it down, put an obstacle in the way. Or if he's going 1v1 every time, we'll give him two defenders to be. I think that's another thing where just in terms of a general skill in your, in your coaching toolkit with kids is you've got to, you've got to keep, keep dipping him in and out of discomfort intentionally as well, I think. But the uh, point you said a minute ago, Saul, about um, uh, the part the just... Just look at general passing and receiving and stuff and 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 touches on the ball and contact time and that. And I, and I just think it's always about what is your intent? What what are we trying? If we understand it, we can then develop that thought process in our players. If it's just, if we haven't got clarity on what, what we want from our players, then it's, it's really difficult to transmit that. And I think the way we get their message across, especially to young kids, and what you said about the first team players is fascinating there, Swan. It's probably why a lot of them are going to one-to-one coaches like yourself and whatever is, you know, the first team players are getting the fruits off the trees. And I think, you know, the lower down we are, we should be thinking like farmers. We genuinely should. So we should be thinking like farmers and thinking about, you know, planting the seed of the tree that we're never going to see the fruits of our labor. We might never see it. And, 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 and you've got to let your ego go that much. You might think that if you just work on passing, little, little Sam in your team is going to become Xavi. He's not. But if you plant a seed, for example, with safe side, when you watch Jack Grealish and how much he gets fouled, or Iniesta, it was just and Zidane, these people are amazing masters of just putting the ball. If the players, a basic concept of if the player's on my left side, if he's near my left arm and left leg, I'm going to put the ball on my right side. If the player's near my right, I'm going to pull it over to the left. A basic concept like that can be planted in a seven, eight, nine year old. They understand it. They're not stupid. Mm. It might not be elite level yet, but you plant that seed and watch it grow. And then hopefully through 12s, 13s, 14s, by the time the 16s coach gets them, you might have an Iniesta or a Xavi that always caps out the right way and twists and turns the correct way. Do you know what I mean? Or is it Dan that I don't think he ever got it wrong? I don't ever remember Dan turning the wrong way, like in terms of coming out into space or whatever. Do you, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that's and that's a great point, isn't it? Because like, you know, players aren't really going to develop those qualities unless you stress them and, you know, challenge them to stay on the ball. You know, some players might do anyway because they're in different environments, but really, you know, you really want all players to have those qualities, all players to be able to say, right, okay, I can actually stand the ball a minute here and try and break pressure and, you know, like try and shake players off. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's the end goal, isn't it? I mean, that's, I think that's where we miss, like I said, I think that's where we like, I was talking about last week's podcast, the last one we did is that that's where we've got to be a bit braver and a bit more proactive and a bit more interventionist, if you like. So, right, we want all these players to have these 1v1 capabilities. When a young age group is more global, we want everyone to be able to dribble and trying to break a line, or everyone to try and break pressure returning turning and, you know, trying to, you know, try and uh, shake players off when you get a bit further down the line in a wide EP. Okay, it's more position specific. What does that look like from our players maybe playing a fullback or a wide player or my centre midfielder? I say, right now, this is it. I'm going to stress these players a bit more, try and make it part of every session where, you know, I'm saying, okay, I'm challenging you now. Can you receive the ball? And it doesn't always look like, okay, it's not a player running at a player from 10 yards away. Maybe it's receiving, you know, from the side to then play the other side or shake him off to play forward to be creative and, you know, create specific 1v1 practices for position specific players in your group, you know what yeah. I mean? So doing that, so, you know, all your, you know, your four, eight, tens, or, you know, your four and your eights, if you like, and receiving to try and from a back to pressure, try and shake the play in, or you're playing lots of your fours, you're getting loads of chance with back to pressure, that sort of thing. So do that. Remember how important individual possession still is in the YDP or even in the PDP, because mm. it's going to make players better, you know, and when you're making players better, then obviously then it makes teams better. Your individual possession makes your group possession better, right? Absolutely, mate. And again, just in like basic concepts. So 
passing looks different for every player, obviously. But there's one thing for me that gets me with goalkeepers, especially considering how much time they get. And they get a one-to-one coach, don't forget, as well. They're one of the, the very unique position in terms of they've got their own coach. They've got their own little personal trainer in their little groups of two, threes and fours. Is the lack of two-footed goalkeepers, knowing that they ain't got a dribble, they ain't really got to do a step over. You know, if they get caught under pressure and Edison or Allison does a little crift, we all go, Ooh, but if you're playing the game correctly, really, if you're really efficient... Even at young level, yes, you want them to drop his shoulder every now and then if they need to get out of trouble. But really, the goalie shouldn't really be doing step overs, right? Fair enough. But it's still good to practice it for their movement as well. So I ain't saying yeah. don't practice it. Definitely get your goalkeepers in the sessions. And they've got to do all that hip movement as well because they don't want to be stiff. They want to be quick and agile around their box. But the two-footedness, like if it's just one simple thing. If a goalie could open up and spray that way and spray that way, and then yeah. when the ball gets played there and they've got to whip it early off the first foot, I think, again, that's a fundamental tool that, Maybe the goalkeepers unit got to work out. I think there's so much room for improvement with possession with goalkeepers. Do you know what I mean? And you look at uh, a David Silver, of course, that goalie's never going to need a David Silver pass. That David, he's never going to need a little through the knee, either needle or a little clip over yeah. the back four. Do you know what I mean? So it's about knowing as they grow, how are we just then, okay, we give them generic stuff and how we're making it more specific as they get older to their, to their position that it looks like they're going to play in or whatever. Yeah, but I think then you say position specific, isn't it? It's position specific, isn't it? So I want my keys, loads of V work, openers, jump mm. backs, loads of flexibility in the hips, one side to the other, transferring the ball, being able to ping it, like say left or right foot, being able to cut even turn out maybe safe side just in case. But the reality is those are those opener works so I can go from one side to the other, so I can just hammer it. So you know, so you, you got these players like Edison when it comes up, they're so controlled and you're so you're such a master of the ball in that situation when it comes across my body. I know that pressure's coming, but I can invite pressure and then play beyond. Do you know what I mean? That's what you want. You know, these mm. players look at the Brighton keeper. Goodness me, like, you know, he's coming right out, isn't he? Sucking players in and being able to play through. That's now the level. Do you know what I mean? So mm. if you're not like working with your keepers on, you know, on the board and really are you, you're just, you know, are you really doing a disservice? You know, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's got to be the questions of what, you know, one day keepers could be so good on the ball now, you know, like a sweeper keeper, mm. isn't they? You know, inviting pressure on and playing through. And again, yeah, putting them in your sessions, you know, letting them come out in the middle of the possession sessions and stuff as well. Because if they can deal with that pressure in practice, you know, when they drop back and they've got a bit more time and space and the game's always in front of them, it's much easier. So dipping them in them out of the five sides, letting them play five sides. You look at Onana and he looks like he could play five sides. You look at Edison, he looks like he could play League One and, and put a number eight on. Or he, he, do you know what I mean? He looks like he could have had a career. If he chose to put the gloves down, he could have been a footballer at, at some level. And going right back, do you remember, do you remember the little bonkers? Um, Mexican keeper Jorge Campos that used to play. Yeah, yeah. He was only about five foot seven, wasn't he? He's he's probably the prototype of what an exceptional football goalkeeper looks like. He used to dribble out. He had incredible passing. He had two feet. He'd, he'd sometimes put the goal uh, the striker shirt on and score loads of goals as well. And but like that's obviously an extreme, but. Yeah, we just want to produce good footballers, and that includes the goalkeeper. There's always been this disconnect, and the goalies do their thing. And but I think in academies that's getting a lot better. You know, I'm lucky to to, to work with Aaron Tilbury. You know, and I watch some of his goalkeeping sessions, and I think it's technically outstanding nowadays. The, what's going on in a lot of the academies with the goalies, the amount of movement, and you know, years ago it just used to be catch it, serve it, catch it. Now it's like there's three or four phases to a practice. Do you know what I mean? Not only have they got their mental agility, they've got their physical mm. stuff coming, they've got loads of technical stuff. But again, working that through the pitch, so I was going to say about like retaining the ball and what that looks like. You know, again, if we look at what is, oh, not passing, but retaining the ball, putting your foot on the ball. We look at goalkeeping, now, don't they put their studs on the ball, almost like futsal style, and you get your centre-halves putting it on. And, and again, if we teach kids as a concept to say, look, guys, this is to get control of the game, this is to slow it down and allow our players, you see your friends that have been running around for a while, so allow them to get organised a little bit. So take the extra three seconds, let your mates get in position, let's get a bit of structure. Lit, lit the lads up front who have just been attacking wave after wave. Let them actually get their energy. So, again, there's like a little tactical concept you can put in there as well. And then, and then, like you said, you can talk about, you know, now we want to entice the pressure to create the space behind. And I, I just think whatever age you're doing, Saul, if it's done correctly, you can you can put the same tactical concept into your practice. It's just about asking why, why and how we doing this rather than not just what. Don't just don't just pass it there, Sam. Do we understand why we are? Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and also, I mean, talk about inviting pressure, I was thinking back again, we talked about Lee Carsley's 21s the other week. I mean, wow. I mean, talk about Levi Carwell, right? Ball coming in, literally, you know, talk about inviting pressure in someone who's so good. I mean, lucky I remember proof. actually my first year at Chelsea, the 10 through was when Levi Carwell's year group, that group had Jamal Musiala, Levi, Tino, Livermento, it's just like more, so many of those players, unbelievable group. But like, you know, him maybe like, 
he's a, the archetypal centre back now. And he's so good on the ball. Like they invite pressure in, let you like you know players a meter away, sucking him in just to touch a pass because he's so comfortable on the ball. He's so good technically and physically and individually tactically as well. I mean, that's the level, isn't it? I mean, look, trying to wrap up now. What's your sort of things would be? You know, sort of last, you know, sort of things, key takeaways. Then thinking about, you know, does possession matter? Yes, absolutely, and we should be obsessed with it. And just just think to yourself. I think if we could have a camera, I think 90% of the coaches would be doing a lot of really good stuff in training. But for some reason, match day changes, then it? it's all about the three points. It's everything that's around it with the parents there and whatever else. And I would say, if you really got a set of values and you really believe in developing technical players that rely on technique and intelligence and then trying to help them grow into the best physical athletes like the Levi Colwills, who's an incredible athlete, great mover, fantastic. You know, he's got the body for the game. Um I'd say just stick to your values and just keep looking at the games as an extension to your training. It's just another opportunity for the kids to learn, express their self, explore their capacity, and just don't change your approach on a Sunday. If you really believe in it Monday to Friday, stick with it and, and just accept that, you know, it, 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 two plus two doesn't always equal four when you're talking about development and stuff. And again, like we always say, so it's, Technique, technique, technique. For me, it's technique and intelligence. Can you can you ask the question why and develop, plant seeds of understanding in the young players? And again, you might not see the see the the, the fruits of your labour, and your team might get relegated from the Eastern Junior Alliance or the Sunday Essex League, whatever it is. But who cares long term if 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 that kid's developing into a, a fantastic footballer? I'm, and I'm putting that to grassroots context. You know what I mean? So yeah, so I know we yes, always say grassroots and academy in it. Absolutely, because all all the players in the academy come from the grassroots at some point, like we all do. do yeah. so, do you know I mean, whether they spend one day there or five years, you know, there's a fantastic player at Spurs. I mean, isn't there? I think um, Alfie Dorrington at the 23s at centre half. I don't think he came into the system with Spurs until he was 14, 15. And, you know, there's loads of boys, and I only found that out the other day, but there's there's, there's loads of boys up and down the country that were, were late developers. But, but the mo mm. most important thing is they were developing, weren't they, mate? So, yeah. And also, you know, I think that, you know, talk about possession, you know, if you want to have, Good quality group possession starts with individual possession. So, you know, whatever age group, your foundation phase, YDP, PDP, don't neglect the individual possession. You know, don't don't forget about how important players got to be on the ball. Because if they're better on the ball, then it makes your group possession work even easier. And, yeah, I mean, that's how you're going to, that's what you want in it. You know, one of those, those players within the team, but they have their individuals, those game changes, if you like, you know, they're going to change the game for you. But listen, again, thanks very much, Glenn. Top draw again, mate. Appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Cheers, everyone, for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed it. And all feedback, welcome. Any ideas for topics for the show, just drop us an email. Drop it at Saul at my pers my com, or you can hit my, uh, Glenn or me up on Twitter. All right, guys, take care. See you later, guys.